trying to record some stuff in my office, and uh, very difficult between all the road construction and the people riding their bikes all of a sudden, like, <laughs> babies crying and... <laughs> Oh. Dogs barking. Dogs barking. Cat, cats. I don't know. Whatever. They're just dropping out of the sky now. They're, this is just a happening place to make a bunch of noise. Anyways. Anyways. Uh, so, okay. We're going to finish talking about the exile um, and the prophets tonight. Uh, next week, we'll have a very short lesson just kind of trying to put all these different Old Testament books kind of together. And helping us to see the timeline of it. Just a real quick thing, just to kind of to kind of close everything off, uh, and then we'll go to um, just real short devotionals, like five minutes, um, and spend the spend the um, next couple weeks uh, playing games. We're gonna have a movie night. Um, one night in October, we're gonna have a trash cleanup, and that's what's on the chart for us. So, <clears throat> one of the things that comes up when well, there's two big issues that come up with the book of Ezekiel um, in, in, in modern culture, argument, whatever. Um, and, and they're both worth looking into, if for no other reason, just so that we won't be kind of, you know, obviously misled into things. Uh, and the first, the first thing is about aliens. And there's a lot of people who believe that the book of Ezekiel mentions aliens. Um... Obviously, these are people who already believe in aliens, and they're looking for the Bible to validate their belief. And do what? I, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> it's okay. Most sane people didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but there are those. Yeah. <laughs> but there are those. Like for instance, there's this house here in Tully that has a sign about aliens or something. I don't know. UFOs are in the Bible. Yeah, UFOs and and this stuff and. <sighs> <laughs> and then there's obviously the the weirdo documentaries and stuff who's like aliens and the Bible. So it's like okay, well let's go ahead and look at that because obviously we don't want to uh, just ignore a claim. We want to look at it and see what it has to say for itself. Ezekiel one fifteen. Well, actually, I would like to ignore <laughs> some things that people say, but you can't. Okay, so Ezekiel one fifteen through twenty says this. Now. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl, and the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being as it were a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around it, all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went before them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went, and the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Now, this is where they have this uh, this idea that this is talking about UFOs and alien visitation. They think that Ezekiel literally saw an alien visitation. Obviously, the wheel would be wheel within a wheel would be like the UFOs that you see, you know, whatnot. The eyes would be either. I, I'm a little bit confused about that. It, it's I, some people think it's the um, like the windows to look through on the UFOs. The, there, there's a lot of different views as to what the what that is. So the the basic question here is, are we really talking about? Well, no. The the basic question here is, what are we talking about? So. If you notice, the first thing that should alarm us is he didn't say anything about um, people being inside of these wheels, and he didn't say it was something that looked like a wheel that was flying. He said it was a wheel. So th that should concern us right there, just to say, okay, so this kind of resembles what some people think a UFO hypothetically might look like, even though, once again, we really don't have any proof of aliens ever existing – or even what their UFOs would look like. So, you know, we have that issue there. So let, let, let's, let's, let's think about this. First off, before you ever get to the middle of the chapter, you know, it's almost like we need pastors who, who spend an entire Sunday evening <laughs> talking about looking at the context and looking at ten verses before and ten verses after. <laughs> Man, if only pastors would preach the word again. So let's let's practice that, okay? Let's let's just let's just take that into account. Let, let's go backwards, in the, the starting in verse one, in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Chibar Canal. Okay, so this is a historical this is a historical place, in a historical time, 
the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Okay, so right there, that should clue us in that this is not actually something that he's seeing. This is a vision of something. That he, okay, all right. So we're not talking about a literal occurrence either way. And then he goes on, goes on through this, and he starts talking about wh what he saw. And then, at cl closing out in verse, um, where is it? Twenty-eight. So going after the event, like the appearance of the bow that is in the in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of, of the brightness all around. Now pay attention to this. Such was the appearance of the lightness of the glory of the Lord. So what what is he seeing a vision of? The glory of the Lord. He, he specifies at the beginning of the chapter and at the end of the chapter. Let's let's read it again. Uh, verse 1. The heavens were open. I saw visions of God. And then in verse 28. Such was the appearance and the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He, cl he specifies at the beginning of the chapter and at the end of the chapter. Now, I'm talking about what I saw in this vision. It was God. Now, so that means that these wheels are not something we should think about something literally being seen but something that has some kind of symbolic or metaphorical um uh purpose some symbolic imagery some some greater point than just a wheel see what i mean so the question is what is ezekiel 1 talking about and ezekiel 1 is actually connected with the next couple of chapters he's talking about the glory of the lord and how it departs from the temple in uh jerusalem and this was something that happened before Babylon came and destroyed the temple. Because that's kind of a big issue. Because, okay, so the temple was built by Solomon, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and it, it, it sanctified it. So that begs the question, how could Babylon have destroyed the temple and not have incurred great divine wrath on themselves? Ezekiel clarifies that, because the glory of the Lord departed. And he, this is a description of what he saw happening. Obviously, the glory of the Lord really did depart. Now, why use symbolic things? I don't know. Revela the book of Revelation says the same thing. It's not something that you should necessarily take everything as a literal um, appearing of something. Like, for instance, when it says, when it talks about grasshoppers and, and stuff, are, are they actually grasshoppers? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> we don't really know. But obviously, that's just the way that apocalyptic and prophetical writings often work. So, uh, he very clear, he, he very obviously clarifies what he's talking about, leaves no room for, 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 you know, confusion. We're all clear that he's not talking about aliens, he's talking about the glory of the Lord. So, there's that. So, you can always twist the Bible, and, and people oftentimes do this, so obviously it makes sense that people who believe in aliens, once again, without any proof, would then recruit the Bible to it because that's like the that's like the icing on on the piece of poop, you know. Oh, I am able to twist the Bible, therefore I surely am right. So, what's the intended meaning of this? That should be something that's even more important than whether or not we can twist it into saying that there's aliens or UFOs. So, obviously, Ezekiel is one of the harder books in the Bible to understand, especially chapter one. I mean, what are we talking about here, Ezekiel? Couldn't you just kind of Clarify it a little bit, maybe shed some light on this. You know, I, I don't know about you, but when I read chapter one, I think, what can I possibly glean from this? And uh, so, okay, so, but a confusing book shouldn't mean crazy theory. There should be kind of this general understanding of the simpler parts of the Bible that are really easy to understand. And then we shouldn't take one part that we don't understand and just kind of run crazy with it and make our own conclusions like, Aliens, because why not? Uh, and then once again, there's the issue that there is no alien proof, of, uh, no no proof of alien life. Now that brings up this this year, um, there were, NASA released some recordings of some flying objects. Let's be absolutely clear, they did not release any information saying that aliens were, were real. They did not release any proof, scientifically or otherwise, that aliens have ever been captured or observed. All that they released was some video footage of some some kind of a flying object. Now, this could have been an object from our own government, from a different government. And you think, oh, no, 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 surely, it, it, surely, you know, our government would all know what's going on. No, no. I mean, even within the same department, they can't get, get their own. I mean, look at everything that, that the government gets their fingers in. CYFD, for instance. Nobody knows what, they're, what the other people are doing in CYFD. Look at uh, when they get involved in healthcare. Nobody knows what's going on there either. 
Look at, I mean, and if you've ever served in the military, the same thing there. Nobody knows what's going on. So you mean to tell me that all the branches of the government all got together and they're like, oh yeah, that, that one's ours. That's just not really likely. They don't even know what the crap's going on. So, yes, there are there are uh, NASA recordings of some kind of an unidentified object. That doesn't mean alien. Everybody online is talking about it like, oh, proof of aliens now. What? There is no, has not yet been any proof of aliens, guys. Don't. Don't get ahead of this. We've just sat and found some recordings of some pretty cool flying object. You, That's it. You know, one thing that, that really confuses me is <laughs> the people who are so adamant that there's no God, yeah. but yet they want to believe in aliens. That's so what, bad. I said the same thing on a blog. I was like, <laughs> how is it that like atheists are like, even uh, I don't believe in God because there's no proof. I believe in aliens because there's no proof. Wait, what? <laughs> the what? <laughs> Anyways, okay, all right. Um, if you believe in aliens, I'm not trying to make fun of you. You can believe in whatever you want. I'm just well, saying the Bible doesn't is not talking about aliens. Were you going to say something? It was sarcastic. <laughs> so moral of the story, no, Ezekiel is not talking about aliens. Um, aliens may exist, and if they do exist, here's the thing: they were created by God, and once there, once we do have proof of them existing, then we'll have to reassess. Well, what does this mean for the church? What does this mean for humanity? However, let's not let's not get too far ahead of ourselves because as of now, they haven't been proven. So, let's just leave it at that. So then, that takes us to the second kind of major thing to look at in Ezekiel, and that's the felt prophecy. Um, if you know anything about Ezekiel, pretty much the entire like last fourth of the book is about uh, a temple being built. And um, you know all the all the different dimensions of it, and I mean it goes into great uh, great detail about this. Um, and he he talks about the temple, all this different stuff. Where, where is Ezekiel? Here it is. Um, so uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but that's in chapters 40 through 48, in that general region. Uh, and he's talking about the, the the temple being built. Let's see if I can just read one little part of it. Um, where is it? In the 25th year uh, of our exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, and the 14th year after the city was struck down, on that very day the hand of the Lord was upon me. He brought me to the city. In visions of God, he brought me to the land of Israel and sent, set me down on a very high mountain on which was a structure like a city to the south. When he brought me there, behold, there was a man whose appearance was like bronze with a linen cord and a measure, measuring reed in his hand. And he was standing in the gateway, and the man said to me, Look, uh, son of man, look with your eyes, and hear with your ears, and set your heart upon all that I shall show you, for you were brought here in order that I might show it to you. Declare all that you see to the house of Israel. So then he goes through, and it's talking about all the different parts of, of the temple being built and all this thing. And it's just this massive temple, really detailed and everything with it. And But the, here's the problem, is that that temple was never built. So that brings us to another problem. That it's been put off as okay, so maybe it's a heavenly temple. Well, see that conflicts with Revelations. Revelation chapter twenty-one, verse twenty-two, says this. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. So we know that he's not talking about a heavenly temple. So we're left with this problem of what do we do with this huge part of Ezekiel that never happened? So there's there's a few ways around this, and I think once again the best course of action isn't to just go in guns a blazing. It's a felt prophecy. Maybe maybe address that with a little bit of hesitancy. Um, it, it, before you write off an entire prophet, you, you might you might not want to take the view that I have full knowledge, I completely understand all things, and just go in it. Because remember, this is something that the Holy Spirit, you know, showed. There's obviously some kind of – at least he claimed that there was some kind of an encounter, and to just kind of write it off, that sounds like a dangerous area to be in. Uh, I don't know exactly where the line of blasphemy is, but that's got to be pretty close. I mean, it's got to be. So maybe maybe hold off on that. Let's let's look at some, some, some ideas before we just say it's false. And the main problem that we have – is the issue of the glory of the Lord. So when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, when Babylon came and destroyed the temple, it says very clearly the glory of the Lord departed. Israel comes back after their exile, to, back to the land. Persia lets them come back. 
and they rebuild a temple, but it's it's a crappy little temple. I mean, it looks terrible. And they're they're kind of disappointed in, in how shabby it looks. And eh. but then Herod comes along later and he rebuilds it, makes it a little bit nicer, kind of renovates it. And so it, it looks a lot nicer, and, and it's so nice that he, that even uh, Jesus' uh, disciples are look at how great our temple is now. And Jesus says, "Ha ha ha! I tell you, the, not even one stone will be left on another." And he's like, "Oh well, that changes things." So here's the issue: is that the glory of the Lord never returned to the temple. It was not in the temple that the exile, the exile was built. It says that very clearly in Nehemiah, in Ezra, and Ezra. And uh, it never came in uh, Herod's temple, and then after Herod's temple, it was destroyed. So we have this issue of, well, where did the glory of the Lord go? Now, the Gospels spell this out, um, and if you notice the direction that Ezekiel says the glory of the Lord departed, it went up the Mount of Olives and left. Well, Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives and went in that same gate, and it was he was the glory of the Lord returning back to Israel. And then he's, he's killed, uh, then the disciples go... Uh, and they hang out in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit is revealed, uh, not revealed, um, poured out on them, and then they go out from there. And that's where the glory of the Lord is. That's why Paul says in one of the Corinthians about how we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that tells us where, where the glory of the Lord went. But in Ezekiel, it clearly says that this new temple that's going to be built, or was built or something, that the glory of the Lord entered this place. So that still leaves us with the question of where is this temple? Now... There are a few options. The first one is that it is a temple that existed in heaven. Um, that wouldn't be beyond reasoning. Uh, there have been, obviously, uh, prophets and whatnot that mentioned specific structures in heaven, um, such as a throne uh, room for God. Um, so it's not beyond the realm of, of possibility that there's, there was a temple in heaven. That's a possibility. Um, uh, another thing is it might be at least partially talking about um, the exiles or Herod's temple that was built. Um, the issue of this would be obviously that those temples were never as great as Ezekiel foresaw it being. So maybe um, it was more of uh, your temple is actually going to look like crap, but God's going to see it as looking great. But then we still have the problem of what about the glory of the Lord. So that doesn't really seem like an overly likely option. Um, it's another option that is metaphorical, but that doesn't seem overly likely because Ezekiel talks about it in pretty concrete terms, like it's something that's actually going to be. So uh, there's that. Um, or there's a last option here that there's some time before the new heavens and the new earth, but after like the Antichrist and the rapture and all that stuff, where there's going to be people who are still living on earth and there's going to be a temple built then. That's a possibility. It's a little bit shady um because obviously when you're done with any kind of end time stuff there's like 50 billion different theories and so it's hard to kind of pin anything down the most likely options i find are either a he's talking about an earthly temple that's going to be built sometime before the new heavens and the new earth so how does the glory of the lord fit in i'm i'm not sure maybe that maybe there's there's room for the idea that something's going to happen with israel uh, after the rapture and everything, um, where they're still on earth, that's a possibility. It seems kind of iffy to me. Um, and then the second most likely option, I would think, would be that it, that it was in heaven. Now, obviously, I'm definitely up for um, questioning my, my beliefs on this one. I, I have no idea. This is something that I've gone back and forth on every, every couple of years, and it seems like every theory that's put out there is kind of lacking. Kind of touching on like the time for the new heavens and new earth, there's always there's talk about a great awakening. Maybe you could have something to do with that. Okay, so what you're talking about is an issue of uh, a lot of people getting saved, and when that's supposed to happen is right before the rapture, um, by the people who talk right. about that, um, and they they also talk about it synonymously with the great falling away. Um, that there's going to be a time of you know a lot of people right. getting saved then somewhere in there people fall away and then raptured. But the problem about seeing it as a great awakening is it's not really biblically based. It's more based on um, what people want to see. 
what the Bible more talks about is that the church will continue to, to grow. It will continue to reach out to people. But before the end, there will be a great falling away. And then there will be all these other things that happen. And that part we're pretty sure about. Um, the question is what happens after that. And are there any gaps in that? So that takes us to like Revelation talking about, like, for instance, the millennial reign of Christ. Well, during that millennial reign of Christ, is the temple going to be built then, maybe? Oh. So we're talking about something long after, and once again, is Revelations giving a complete picture, or is he picking and choosing from like things that happen like years apart? So it's kind of one of those things. With, right. It's, it's like this huge... I don't know. It's like, for instance, people think that we're still waiting for the time of tribulation. Well, yeah, we're still waiting for, you know, the last seven year of tribulation. Yeah, we're still waiting on that. But then to assume that there's going to be no no suffering in the meantime until that time is just, that's not what the Bible says. So, okay. There's a lot of different theories there. Don't say that something is failed until it's all over. You know when you'll know if Ezekiel's prophecy was actually wrong? When we're at the very end of all this stuff that is prophesied and we can clearly look back and say, okay, yes it did happen or no it didn't happen. Until then, we really don't know. There is still room for fulfillment, even if we don't understand, even if we don't quite understand how that fits in. There's still room for, for, for it to happen. So, But something that is extremely important that people oftentimes miss because they get a little bit too caught up into the argument itself. Ezekiel lived in Babylon, which was really the height of civilization at his time. Uh, extremely wicked, yes, but the height of civilization at his time. And it was a perfectly mapped out city. I mean, it just looked great. Um, it had some of the wonders of the world. I mean, these are things that are just, like, legendary. People still talk about the hang hanging gardens of, of Babylon. So this is something that is, you know, physical perfection as far as humans can, humans can fathom. So Ezekiel, faced with this, has this prophecy that shows God's plan of even greater perfection than he is seeing. Something that the people couldn't even imagine. That even the temple, just the dimensions of the temple, took a great deal of, of um, time to talk about. Let alone, you know, obviously, Jerusalem. So, uh, it should be seen, obviously, beyond when it's fulfilled. We should, all, we should always look at it with that. Realizing that, in response to Babylon's attempt at perfection, God had his own plans of perfection. And I, I think that's worth, um, worth remembering. Okay, so uh, we're pretty much done looking at the at the major uh, prophets. Um, there's Isaiah, um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Uh, we spent some good time in Daniel talking about different uh, historical issues. Um, and although people are overly critical on the book, I, I appraised it as overall we should see it as one of the most valuable books, um, really, of the prophets. Um, Isaiah, very much so historically grounded. We already looked at the history with... Um, all the, the things with uh, Hezekiah and whatnot, and Isaiah just kind of talks a lot about that. And uh, so we know that his prophecies were true. We know that it fits in historically, really just a great there. Jeremiah fit in perfectly, um, gives us more uh, important details on those things too. Um, and then Ezekiel, we just looked at the two biggest issues that, that, that are there in that book. Um, and uh, so that takes us to the minor prophets. Most of them I'm not really going to mention. I already mentioned about the one prophet that talks about northern Israel having multiple kings at one time. Um, I think that was Hosea. Uh, we already looked at um, a lot of the things that are worth looking at. I mean, everything that they recorded, you know, happened. So it's like, well. Um, and just if you're if you're one of those people who's like, I don't want to read about the end times because I find it scary or I don't find it relevant. Um, you're in luck. The majority of the things in the prof prophetic books of the Old Testament have already happened. So uh, you don't have to be afraid when you read them. You know, it's it's more of just um, you can still learn things from them. So don't don't shy away from them because they are they do still have ways of applying to us. Um, anyways, that takes us to Jonah. Uh, he's the last m of the prophets that really we have a, a, an issue uh, with historically that we're going to have to resolve. So, in the book of Jonah, starting in chapter uh, 3, which is, I believe, the last uh, chapter, or near the last chapter. No, that's Joel. Going to the wrong place. 
No, it's the second to last chapter. Okay, Jonah 3, verse 3, and then to 4. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Okay. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey. So he only went a third of the way into the city. Okay, so let's let's look at this. Here's the issue is that Nineveh wasn't that big. If people travel typically 50 miles in a day walking, okay, we're talking about a massive city. We're talking about something that, that is just let, let's lower that. Let's say people let's say people walked 20 miles a day. 20 miles a day. You can walk 20 miles a day. 20 miles is good. So then 20 times 3, we're talking about 60 to 70 miles. That's just an enormous size city. And there's no proof of none of that being that, that big at this time. So we have a little bit of a problem there. Um, 70 miles is just too big for, for this to be taken seriously. Well, there, there's a few things that, that are kind of kind of important to realize. First off, Nineveh had two other cities that were close by, and so you could be talking about the Metroplex. You know what I mean? This city and the surrounding areas. Like when you talk about Albuquerque, you're actually talking about Albuquerque, Bernalillo, Rio Rancho. You're talking about all these other cities, but you just say Albuquerque. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and when you drive up to it, you really can't see like a differentiation, and it's Albuquerque. You know what I mean? And so you could be talking about it like that, in which case, okay, well, the problem is resolved. That completely resolves that. Um, but then there's another another uh, view that is actually uh, – there's nothing really wrong with it. He might be talking about um, around, not through. Um, it was you know three days if you walked around the whole thing, which would mean it would be about 16 miles through. This matches. This fits. That, so that, that would definitely resolve the problem. That's exactly how big it was. So uh, he th – there's no problem with that view at all. Um, another 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 theory is that he might just be he might not be talking the literal literal terms he might just be saying that it was really big it's going to take me three days to walk through that you know what I mean there's there's possibilities in all three of these views so whichever one you find the most likely either way you shouldn't um, you shouldn't think that that Jonah is in, is a book that didn't actually happen um, just because of that. So, okay, uh, verse uh, verse 4, this is something that's actually a little bit more important than how big the city was. That um, is kind of a big issue. So, Jonah gets swallowed by this large water animal. We don't know exactly what it was. He didn't tell us the genus. <laughs> he didn't tell us the species. <laughs> um, he didn't describe it to us. Just this large aquatic animal, and it swallows him. And for three days he's inside the belly of this, and we're probably all thinking of the scene on Pinocchio, you know, where there's a boat inside and he's just sitting inside fishing. But chances are he's a lot more cramped than that. <laughs> um, so okay, he's inside the he's inside the belly of a whale, and uh, okay, all right, so so here he is, and he says, okay, God, you know what, I I, I messed up, my bad. We're all good, you know, I, I I'm sorry. And God's like, oh, okay, cool. So the animal throws him up. And uh, I hope, genuinely hope, that he washed himself off before oh, I hope so. <laughs> before he went anywhere. The smell. So then he goes to Nineveh, and he acts like everything's hunky-dory, everything's fine. But then he, he shows little signs that he's not really okay with what's happening. And one of the signs is found in verse 4, a very big issue. He just said, exceedingly large city, three days to walk through. Okay, all right. Oh, another view is maybe he's talking about three days to walk through as far as if you were to go to, were to go down every street to every house. It would take me three days to go to all the houses. That's that's very likely too. You know, if he's saying, okay, so I'm not just gonna go yell at the at the wall of the city, I'm gonna go down every street and make sure everybody has a chance to hear. But I'm not really gonna do that, because we'll listen to verse four. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey. That's as far as it gets. And never says any more uh, and he called out, yet forty days and then it shall be overthrown. So, okay, he does the very bare minimum, just barely sets foot into the city, and then he just says, hey, you all are going to die. And then, he, so he doesn't even really try to, like, evangelize. And then we get to verse 5, and it says, and the people of Nine Nineveh believed in God. They called for a fast. Hold on, somewhere in here it says, right here, verse 6, the word reached the king of Nineveh. Jonah didn't even go to the king. 
he just barely sets foot into the city and says, y'all are going to die. And they all start do repenting all on their own. And so that they call for a fast, and then the word gets to the king, who did not call for the fast. The people just started fasting. So he overhears about it, and he's like, oh, snap. And it says, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now, I don't know how genuine this was, but if he's anything like our politicians, he probably just did it because everybody else was already doing it. <laughs> anyways, anyways, anyways. Um, so Gen Jonah really did the bare minimum, and that's kind of... That's kind of the highlight of this whole thing. That he, he goes and he does just the absolute poorest job that he can possibly do. And yet, God still works a miracle. Just amazing. So, and then we get to verse 12 through uh, chapter 4, verse 1. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is one of the foundational books about... Old Testament theology. There are some people, the Jews of Jesus' day, for instance, that thought that salvation was only for the Jews. And that God didn't want to save anybody else. That God didn't love anybody else. That um, it was never in his plan to save anyone else. And yet we see here that even Israel's enemies God wanted to save. And then he says, even at the end of the, end of the verse, uh, end of the book, should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Even if I didn't care about the people, what about all the animals? So this is an absolute smack in the face of what the Jews of, of Jesus' day were, were, were teaching. And yet they were too blind to see it when it was already there. <sighs> so anyways, and here's another little point here. Here, when you get to chapter 4, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Jonah never told the people of Nineveh that the threat was gone. Are you seeing how jacked up this is? He goes, barely sets foot in the city, just tells them that they're going to die. They repent all by themselves. He, did, he didn't do anything about it. And so then God turns from his wrath, and he doesn't even tell them the danger is past. And I can't help but wonder, because this repentance lasted one generation. The next generation of Nineveh was evil again, and Nineveh was destroyed. Uh, I just can't help but wonder if Jonah would have told them, because you repented, God has repented of his wrath, what that would have done for them, versus what he did, where they were left to their own imagination. Maybe they did something like this. There was a guy who talked about us being destroyed, and it never happened. We repented for nothing. See what I mean? Maybe, it's just maybe, if Jonah would have put a little bit more heart into the people that he was so anxious to kill, that might have lasted for more than a generation, maybe. Just maybe. But it's worth noting that he did the bare minimum, and then he didn't even tell them that God's wrath was passed. Um, if you do, if you are interested, I want to I want to recommend a website that I just came across this week. It's called Defending Inerrancy. Um, it is a book. I mean, it is a website that has every single part in the Bible. You pick which book, you pick which part of the book, and it talks. It basically just talks about it. And this is uh, one of the places that um, gave me some of the ideas on on for Jonah. So I definitely wanted to pass it on to you. I will update the Yams website, you know, that, that post that I have on the Yams thing. I'll, I'll add it onto that one too. So, okay. Um, so, okay. But let's just say, let's just say that Jonah's measurements of the city of Nineveh are wrong. Does that mean that his prophecy is wrong? No, maybe he just was terrible at measuring. Or maybe he was really <laughs> slow. Or maybe he was really slow. Maybe he had a gimp with his legs. Especially after that one. That, <laughs> that fish, yeah. He, it's like on that movie El Dorado with John Wayne. He was limping when he left. He was limping when he got here. <laughs> you guys don't watch Westerns? Okay, it's fine. Uh, anyways, so let's just look at a few more things with the prophets so we can close this thing out. Uh, the, books, um, the books of the prophets are mostly irrelevant to the Israelites of the post-exile. What I mean to say is this. If the, if the prophets were made up literature, they just made up what was written, why wouldn't they have made up something that applied more to the generation that they were in rather than the generation that had already died? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you have twisted it to make it more of a propaganda thing? 
why not write something that relates better to the audience? Prophecy, and another thing that I hinted at before, I just want to kind of emphasize this again, prophecies were checked meticulously at that time, and they were well-preserved because they were usually called upon for reference. Okay, let's see. Oh, well, didn't this prophet say this? Bring it up. In fact, I believe that there's a part specifically mentioned in one of the books of the kings where he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, you can't stone him for that because this prophet actually already prophesied about that. And then they bring it up and they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. So then they don't kill that prophet. But don't quote me on that. I, I don't remember exactly where that is. Um, but so, okay, the prophecies were checked meticulously. The prophets made sure that it was written very accurately. It was it was taken to the king and all this different stuff. There were a lot of different search uh, things in place. So to assume that the biblical prophets were inaccurate is just nonsense. Um, a call to faithfulness to God wouldn't mean much. Check it out if it wasn't ingrained in their heads and culture already. If you were to tell somebody, return to what God told you to do in the law, what law? You can't tell people to return to something that they didn't know. So the very fact that the prophets were telling them to return back to living morally like the law told them to argues for the fact that they were historical and that the books of the law were even older still because they had to have been long enough for the people of Israel to mass believe or at least know of them. Um, so there's a few issues that people bring up about the name of God. The name of God is Yahweh. That's the only name that he's ever given to us for him. There are names that we give to him like Adonai, uh, Jehovah Shalom, these different things. Okay, great. Those aren't the names that he gives for himself. The only name that he ever gave for himself was Yahweh, um, and he gives that in the book of Exodus. Um, so there are some names that are talked about of God that are also names for other deities. So let me just kind of clarify the confusion. Uh, one name that is used for God is El. This is a general term meaning God. Yes, there was a Canaanite God whose name was El. That is true. However, God's traits don't really relate that much with El's traits. And El, was, El also became more of a general term as some gods rose to prominence and other gods kind of went by the wayside. Then there was another name, Baal, or also said Baal. Um, this is basic, a real basic definition of this word is master or lord. So you could call uh, your boss, Baal. You could call, a, hus a wife could call her husband, Baal. Um, you know, uh, a, a slave could call, could call his master, Baal. So this is something, you know, remember that it has a, a lot of different meanings. And then in Canaan, it actually talks about in the Bible, the Baals. Now the reason for that is because there were multiple Baals, God, gods. And at different times, maybe one was more prominent than others, but there were multiple gods called Baal, Baal this, Baal that. Um, so it was a term that was used for gods and for people. So it shouldn't concern us that much whether it refers to God in this kind of a context. What's important is rather the character behind the God of the Bible rather than um, which name we choose to call him that. It's like the name uh, Allah is a general term just meaning a God. And then as Islam developed, it became more um, – well, let me kind of reverse here. There was, a God, there was a bunch of gods, and one of them was Allah. Then as Islam got started, um, they kind of just hijacked that, and, and it just became more of general God. So uh, it's the same kind of concept. It, when, we, when we pray, do we, do we always say Yahweh, or do we say God? Well, we, we say God. It's just a general term. Now, other people might not know which God we're talking about, but we do, right? Okay, so same kind of idea. Um, El was associated with the bull in Canaan, which is kind of gives light on the Exodus event. If you remember, Moses goes up on the mountain, and they, and they make a bull, and they start worshiping it. And the question being, why? Well, it, uh, idols at that time were more of – they didn't necessarily believe that the god was literally the idol. They believed that the idol was the gateway to the god. That's a, that's a good enough definition. So Moses was Israel's gateway to god, Yahweh. So with Moses gone, they were like, there's no way to reach the god. So let's make an idol of him. Well, in Canaanite culture, El was associated with the bull, so it made sense to make a calf. Okay, let's do that. And uh, bulls were also a sign of fertility, so they were probably trying to get God to bless them since Moses was gone. Obviously, we know how that went. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> um, with Moses gone, Israel wanted another means of interacting with Yahweh. The idol of the bull was their proposed gateway to Yahweh.
obviously God had already told them, though, before Moses went up that mountain and disappeared for 40 days, he clearly told them, don't make an idol in 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 in, in representation of, of me. Okay, that's just not going to happen, okay? All right, Moses coming on. And then they still didn't listen. So I don't know. They they didn't listen. They didn't listen. Um, so, okay, when we're looking at, at the books of the Old Testament, something that's very important that's often overlooked when gods are specifically mentioned and sacrifices are specifically mentioned, it severely limits when they could have been written. Because certain gods were only popular at certain times, and certain means of sacrifices were only popular at certain times. So this helps us to date things. So when people say Deuteronomy was definitely written in 600s BC instead of in 1400s BC, and what historical basis do you claim that on? Well, there were these different documents, J, E, D, and P, and the different cults kind of got together and they kind of mentioned it based on what historical evidence. There's nothing that backs up these ridiculous views. And yet people tote them around like it's not scholarly to not believe this unhistorical nonsense. Anyways, um, so they were not written in the exile. There's absolutely no proof of that. They attempt to relate Yahweh with Canaanite worship practices. There's really nothing to base that on. When people say that Yahweh was a Canaanite god, there's there's nothing to, nothing historical to base that on. God was not physically present by idols, so the destruction of the temple didn't amount to much in Jerusalem when, when Babylon came. So then that takes us to an issue that some people have. Well, what about the present the possible presence of, of Yahweh uh, in the land of Moab? Well, here's the thing. We've already dated when the Exodus was and all those things, and any presence of, of Yahweh in Moab was after the Exodus, after um, after all these things with, with dating with Egypt and with Israel and all these different things. So Israel's influence, it's more evidence that Israel was influencing the area, not that Yahweh originated from there and Israel just kind of took hold of this cult and made it their own. Um and then that brings us to the last point I want to mention. Prophets don't just start from nowhere. There had to be a basis for, for, for a, prophet, a prophecy, a basis for the prophecy being preserved. Why the prophecy related to previous generations rather than current generations. There's just so many different things. Prophets don't just start from nowhere. They didn't just, oh, one day I'm going to write a book of prophecy. And any view that just discredits the books of the prophets just because, well, I don't want to believe that the Bible is inerrant has serious, serious flaws. You really have to have to take it for what it is and actually look at the evidence that presents itself there. So we're done looking at uh, the archaeology of the Old Testament. As you can see, there's some things that we that we wish we had more information on, some things that is hard to deal with the information that we've got. But as in all things with the Bible, there's, there's really not much basis for disbelieving it. Really, there, I mean, there's some things that are a little bit questionable, but when you take it as a whole with all the other things, it's like, that one thing doesn't break the camel's back. It's really not that big of an issue. Um, yeah, there's just, I mean, you're going to see more more findings in the near future that, that is going to just further validate the Bible. But as far as it is now, we have as much as, as good of an understanding to know that nothing's going to break the camel's back on this one. Um, okay, any questions? Nope. Okay, so next week will be a very short lesson, and we'll go straight to the games. Just... The chronology, you know, what, when did these things happen, kind of setting them in a bigger picture so they're not just disconnected parts for you. So, um, okay.